Hello and welcome to City Council Comments. I'm Steve Antis, sitting in for Steve Erickson. On the program today, we're going to talk about the regular City Council meetings for the 2nd of March and March 22nd. And here to break down some of the highlights is the Honorable Mayor, Jerry Cook. Welcome to the program. Sitting in for myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's great to have you here, Jerry. It's wonderful um, to be here. Thanks. You know, me. spring has sprung. We are so glad that we missed the snow, of course, from the other day. I had to go to the airport this morning. There's quite a line of demarcation down at the... Yeah, there's a lot of snow down there. But uh, nothing up here. It still looks like spring. It's nice. Oh, fantastic. So let's get right down to things. Um, mm -hmm. On the March 22nd meeting, of course, uh, there were a few things in the consent agenda that are of particular interest. Uh, the city did request some state aid funding for the 2016 street reconstruction program mm -hmm. and uh, you know street reconstruction is a huge thing here in the city of Coon Rapids. Oh absolutely, absolutely and this year we're going after it really aggressively. Normally we request MSA funds, Minnesota state aid funds in advance to reconstruct the roads this year we're going after seven and a half miles of state aid roads being very aggressive getting them done and then we're going to bond and pay that back over 10 years so it's going to get a lot more roads done sooner and uh, the payback is better because you don't have the cost of inflation on the construction and the residents get to enjoy the better streets absolutely but this year this this year will be that year tearing off the band-aid where there will be a lot of construction to deal with wow busy summer yep so uh, another item, uh, the council approved a new pawn shop on Coon Rapids Boulevard. A few months ago, we renewed the license for the, the pawn shop over off of uh, University near Blaine. And that was the only one we had in town. And the city clerk looked and said, not for long. Apparently, they, they were, had the inside track. So we have a new pawn shop coming in on Coon Rapids Boulevard, 1923 Coon Rapids Boulevard. It's gonna be just east of Hanson. It's the, uh, it's the old Country Club Market building for those that have been around for a while. Um, most recently, I think it was uh, an O'Reilly Auto Parts back there. So, and uh, it's, it seems like a real good businessman. He's, he, he, um, they plan to work closely with our police department, which is a great asset for our force to uh, keep track of anything that shouldn't be there maybe that's stolen or something so it should be fine all right and now uh, council also adopted resolution in support of the minnesota green corps application for the 2016 2017 year yep and and as most folks know coon rapids is very aggressive in recycling we are the kind of the little star in anoka county where we handle most of the recycling um We've, we've got the big, nice facility and the most production, I think. Colleen Sinclair is doing a great job as our recycling coordinator yeah, to run that is. operation. Yes, yeah, she is. And this is, uh, this is a, a component now that will allow us to better track multi-housing units, of which, of course, we have many. And it's, again, it's most of this, the funding comes from the state through the county, so it isn't a cost to our residents, and it's, uh, and it's a big benefit to have here. Now this application gets approved by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and uh, the city should know sometime in mid-March or rather mid-April whether that application gets approved or not. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's, a, it's yeah. as you said, there are so many multi-unit dwellings in yeah. the city and so they're just really continuing the program that they started last year. Yes, yes. Okay, so another uh, item here that... Uh, Council is uh, looking at is the uh, considering resolution. Uh, they awarded a contract for the 85th Avenue Trail construction project. This has been a long time coming. When you go down between East River Road and University on 85th Avenue or the old County Road 132, everything to the east of the railroad tracks it's the elevated boardwalks. It's all these nice trails connecting into Springbrook Nature Center. As you go to the west of the railroad tracks over to East River Road, you've just got this two-lane road with no shoulders. And every time I go down there and somebody's bicycling or, or I'll often see people jogging along that trail, I just think they're taking their lives in their hands on that road with all that traffic. 
We've gone to the DNR a couple times trying to get a grant to get this trail constructed and have been denied. And now we are able to just build it out of the park bond referendum. Um, it was nice. It came in a couple hundred thousand dollars underneath what the engineers expected that it would be. We had to work closely with all of the multifamily homes there to get uh, to get easement agreements. But because this is being allocated, I'm sorry, the work is being done by Valley Valley Construction. Valley Paving was. Incorporated. Thank you. Um, it's the same company that's doing the intersection by the new Sand Creek Park. Um, so they want to get everything going at the same time. They're going to get right on it, and this is going to be done before like June is the plan, or like June 21st or something. So it's going to be really nice. It's going to be a connection now from Springbrook Nature Center all the way over to the Kennedy Park area on East River Road, and it's just going to be so much better for our residents. Yeah, and you know, they're uh, in the middle of that construction project expanding Springbrook Nature Center, so mm -hmm. it's just going to be a magnificent thing for our residents to be able to just kind of walk, bike uh, into that park and enjoy the new facility. Yep, absolutely. No, nope, that's great. Now, the only item of new business that the council looked at uh, at this particular meeting on March 22nd was considering an abatement services contract. And tell us about that. Um, so, yeah, so our, our code enforcement, if we end up with a vacant home that needs to be secured, if you've got a home that, you know, for whatever reason, they're unable to deal with a lot of junk in their yard. Um, you give them opportunities to collect or to pick it up. And if they can't, eventually we have to have somebody that, can, that we can call. And so they sent out a request for qualifications because this is one where we need one company that we can call that will do everything. That'll go out there, that'll abate the, the junk in the yard, that'll secure the building, that'll winterize it and verify that the property's been winterized. Um, there's just so many th uh, things that they need to be able to do. This is a company we have experience with, their bids were competitive, and so we've hired um, Do All Services. I get a very appropriate name, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to, to take care of that. So, and yeah, so we need it to be fair, we need the pricing to be reasonable, and we need them, most importantly, to be timely and be able to do it all. All right. Well, it's going to switch our uh, gears here to the March 2nd meeting where uh, Council had a couple of uh, presentations and the first one was from Family Promise. Family, Prom yeah, Family Promise is a wonderful organization that actually helps homeless families. It actually, mom, dad, kids, everybody. Um, and in fact, they've, they're having a very, they had their first or they're having their first one of their homeless families, the mom is actually having a baby. So the executive director from Family Promise was, you know, drove, the, drove them to the hospital to have this baby. Um, but it's a, it's a powerful coalition of churches, you know, faith communities, um, where they take turns hosting these families. There's a, a day center for them out at uh, Lord of Life in Ramsey, just, you know, just into the Ramsey border. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful organization. One of the things, of course, they pointed out was that they receive grants from Anoka and over, I think, Blaine and Anoka County. And it's something we need to look at. We need to look at considering whether we're going to grant, give them a grant or not. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like they do great work, you know, real hands-on uh, driving someone to the hospital to deliver a baby. Well, they do, they do. And, and, and to provide the meals, to provide the daycare center, it's all about what works is a hand up. That's what works. You know, the handouts, those just continue. But when you can actually give people a hand up and help them get back onto their, you know, get back on plane again, um, it's, it's great. It's a great operation. All right. And we also had a presentation from the uh, newly elected Senator Jim Abler and Representative uh, Peggy Scott. Yeah, it was nice that they uh, stopped in and just kind of gave us an update of what's going on down at the Capitol or what they foresee this legislative uh, year. Um, they're both on board with us for our Hanson overpass. You know, we've, we've re essentially got three things floating down at the Capitol right now. We've got the Hanson grade separation. Um, the Highway 10, you know, the, the portion of that project in Coon Rapids is getting the third lanes on Highway 10 from Hanson out to Round Lake Boulevard. And then we've got, a, um, we've got a tax bill down there to extend our TIF district 
the old Coon Rapids Boulevard Shopping Center. So it's great to have this nice relationship with these local legislators, and it's nice that they show this interest in us. So, Great. Um, under the consent agenda, there were a couple of items uh, that we'd like to talk about. Uh, Council approved expenditures for Woodview Park upgrades. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, Coon Rapids, we've got a lot of beautiful parks. That park bond referendum is allowing us to go in and really make them really nice for our residents. Woodview Park was when I was embarrassed to say I didn't know where it was um, until I looked and then I went, oh, of course, I know where that is. I just didn't know what it was called. And it's the one over between all of, it's just north of Northdale Boulevard and west of Olive Street, right behind that faith community there. Um, I don't recall which church that is, but um, it's a very nice park. And this is going to be new playground equipment and then fixing up the shelters, making the shelters look a little more modern, putting some uh, brick columns around them. So it should be nice. And, of course, for those uh, that uh, need the services, uh, there will be portable toilets available as well as part of this upgrade. Okay, good. I didn't remember that. <laughs> now, with respect to uh, the next item, Council approved an online bill pay for utility billing. Uh, it's a new service that the city will have for residents. Yeah, it's, it's really it's an expansion of a service because you've been able to pay your bills, your, your water sewer bill online, um, but this is making it more robust. You can, you can, see, you can see more information. You can, you've got more flexibility in how you pay your bills. Um, and this is going to encourage people to use their, their ACH, their checkbooks, because there's going to be a 295, I think it's a 295 mm -hmm. charge for using your credit card. You know, we've been paying $26,000 annually in credit card fees to provide this service for folks. And if, if it just seems like all the residents shouldn't have to pay for the few that do use the credit card. So it's just a nice way to take that back off the balance sheet here and make it more convenient for folks. Absolutely. Yeah, essentially a, a new software that's uh, cloud-based and uh, will be, uh, as you say, cost savings to the city and also for residents if they do choose to use that uh, checking account debit. Yeah, cloud-based. It always sounds like, yeah, it's just somebody else's server it's sitting on. But Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Council also approved a waiver for the carnival license fee for the 2016 spring Fest celebration on May 20th and 21st at the Church of the Epiphany. This is the first sign of spring, really. You know, some people look to the birds. Some of us that have looked at the council meetings look for the application. So this was waiving the carnival license fees for the 2016 Spring Fest. Yes, May 20th and 21st. It's coming up, and it's a uh, sure sign of summer. All right. So. Well, uh, and, uh, some of the old business at this meeting that was of interest, uh, Council did adopt an ordinance uh, adding requirements for micro distilleries, brew pubs, and brew tap rooms in the city of Coon Rapids. Um, yes, and, uh, and what that does is it actually allows them to come in. In the past, you could actually open a, uh, you could open a brewery here down at our industrial park but you couldn't open a micro brew. You know, you couldn't come in and we weren't licensed for that. So now we've amended our zoning. This action amends our licensing, creates an ordinance to allow micro distilleries, micro brews, tap rooms, um, growler sales. It, uh, it allows the, uh, the Sunday growler sales. Um, it expands the, uh, the time on Sundays. What used to, what used to, have to start at 10 a.m. can now start at 8 a.m. It's basically trying to say Coon Rapids is open for business, you know, and bring it on. So. And, and I understand <laughs> that there are some residents that are interested in going into this business in the city. The, yeah, this is something that we should have done, you know, earlier. I mean, we're a little bit behind the eight ball on this one. But fortunately, we've got some residents that would like to open one here in town, and they've been... Um, advocating for this and every time it's on the agenda they show up and they celebrate and <laughs> so it shouldn't be too long we should see one I don't know where or when but somewhere in town we should see one all right stay tuned now uh, council also adopted an ordinance amending city code 5-900 uh, which is uh, concerning tobacco 
We, we workshopped this last year, and when it was coming to workshop, our conference room was full of people that had an opinion on this. And I think it was because it was right on the heels of Bloomington. Bloomington, I think it was, yeah, it was Bloomington, when they, create, when they changed their ordinance, they made it so if you sell e-cigs or um, the vaping pens or what, I don't even, whatever they call those, um, you couldn't, you couldn't use them in the shop. You had to go outside and like 100 feet from the building in order to use them. That doesn't work in their business model because apparently those little vaping pens will stop working. They need to be able to repair them, to test them in there. People want to be able to test the various flavors or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so what this ordinance does is this allows them, if they sell the e-cigs, that you can actually do the vaping in the room. It doesn't... It, so this is about sampling as opposed to enjoying the entire e-cig. I, yeah, I think that's a nuance. I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't think that there's a set time. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think this just allows them to vape in their building. I see. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yes. Certainly there's a lot of other communities that are trying to completely eliminate uh, the e-cig in their cities. And, and I, I think what's happening is there's so many studies out there. We're kind of waiting to see what happens. And I, I, frankly, I think this is going to come down from the state again. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't want to limit somebody in business in how they conduct their business, you know, especially when we don't know, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to be that nanny guy, you know, that I, I would just as soon um, allow them to do their business. They've said this is important. This allows them to do that. And if the state dictates something later, then of course we'll, we will adhere to that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it absolutely does. Okay, good. <laughs> um, now, looking at some new business, uh, council upheld the Planning Commission's recommendation to deny a code amendment to allow boat and motor repair in the Port Campus Square. And what an awkward time to have to discuss this. Right after I tell you I don't like to interfere with how people do their business. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a, a business located on Coon Rapids Boulevard and Crooked Lake Boulevard. It's, it's in an existing um, automotive repair building. And the automotive repair um, operation got a conditional use permit to operate there in the Port District a long time ago. Sometime over the last few years, a boat marine re repair place moved in on the West End. It's not allowed, they, that actually is not an allowed use right there. Um, and what's happened is it, it just sort of grows. Cars, you bring your car in in the morning, they fix it, and you drive it home that night. There's a few or a couple maybe left over for bigger repairs. But it seems like the boats come in and then they don't leave. And the boats just kept acquiring there all last year. Most of the winter, there was this big, must have been a 30-foot cruiser sitting there covered. And it just, it, it didn't work there. You can't have any outside storage in the port district. And this was a very intensive outside storage use. And it was an eyesore for Coon Rapids Boulevard. It's still an eyesore now. There's still about four boats there. There's, there was the other day I counted, there was a 23 cars sitting out there. Um, so we upheld the, um, let's see, how did, how well, did that work? It, it, well, the Planning Commission denied it. Yes. And we upheld the Planning Commission's denial. Right, because it was a request for a code amendment right. to allow this. So since we do have a business that's currently operating in that area with these boats, yeah. How much time do they have to kind of get rid of the boats? Well, we gave them a, we, there's a, there's a hard line of six months, but staff has direction to use their discretion. Um, if, if we're close, if they've, if they've culled it down where they don't have all the things outside and they have something they can move into in eight months or something, they're not going to throw them out, sure. you know, in, in six months. Mm -hmm. But if they're not making any progress, if they're not looking at anything and everything is still sitting out there, six months, we've given them a directive to say, you can in six months say, we're done now. 
So it's it's a needed service in Coon Rapids. I mean, we've got the river in town. We have, lo we have Crooked Lake. We have lots of recreation. Um, clearly, people needed to have marine repair. It just wasn't an ideal spot for it. You know, a better spot was, you know, where Rapid Sports Center used to be, the boats were all, were all in the back in a fenced-in area or they are you know, out of sight from the boulevard. Um, so hopefully they find another spot in Coon Rapids because clearly it's, it's a needed business here. Um, we would just like to be a little less obtrusive. And there are zoning areas for this type of operation, as yes. you said. Yes, Yeah, just not in the ports. Okay. Uh, another item under new business is the council considered request uh, for two part-time positions at CTN. Just maybe want to touch on the growing operation that we have here at the uh, cable TV department. Yeah, we, well, we do. And, and one of the things that I love about CTN is how forward thinking you know it, it's CTN was started to I believe just to kind of take care of community events but as the cost of equipment goes up and as the cost of production goes up they've found other modes of, of other revenue streams um, from the St. Paul Saints games to the snow cross to the St. Thomas football games to you know all these outside things that are that have the revenue coming in to help pay for the infrastructure well now we need a little more production help <laughs> to kind of offset that if i'm understanding our needs here and i have a feeling you know better than i do well and we have <laughs> you know some very talented individuals um i don't want to say anybody particularly josh Yudvig, um, who <laughs> are being pulled in multiple different ways and so to have more personnel will certainly help uh, as you said, we have production services that have mm -hmm. been expanding upwards of 20% annually. Okay. So um, one other thing I guess uh, I wanted to mention is I know you're going down to the state capitol today yep. to testify on behalf of the uh, Hanson grade separation at uh, the railroad crossing there. Yes. So last night we had, um, we had an open house over at Epiphany on Hanson Boulevard to discuss the uh, Hanson grade separation, getting the, the cars and the, and, the, and the trains separated. Um, there were about 250 people there. It was very well attended. And it was, there was a presentation from the, uh, um, from the consultants on it. The county was there. They had all kinds of tables set up. There's a great concern from the residents. You know, first off, we feel we need this for public safety and just to get cars through town. Coon Rapids, Coon Rapids was built, the railroad tracks were here first. Nobody's questioning that the tracks were here first. But Coon Rapids developed around the old Red Ox Cart Trail, which was then, which became Highway 10. And all of our development was, you know, along there. Well, then in the 60s, the late 60s, they moved Highway 10 to the north end of town in our infrastructure and our housing has kind of followed that movement. Well, so now these north-south corridors across the tracks are key to getting back and forth for our, for our public safety and for our residents. Um, Hanson Boulevard is an intersection of 12,500 cars and an average of 81 trains a day. We're also unfortunately in the perfect spot, the perfect distance from the Northtown Rail Yard to stage trains. So everybody in town knows what it's like to come down Hanson, see those crossing arms coming down or down, and end up sitting there for anywhere from five to 30 minutes waiting for these trains to clear. It's a problem, and it's a real problem if we've got an ambulance on one side trying to get to an emergency on the other, or I can't tell you how many times I've gone south and I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the front of a fire truck on the other side of the tracks waiting to get north um, Chief Piper talks about fires doubling in size every minute. You, when you think about um, a life and death situation, if you think of a cardiac arrest, if you think about any first aid emergency, do you want to be laying there waiting for the ambulance to be sitting there waiting for the tracks? Alina talks about going to an accident response at 108th and Hanson or somewhere right in there, and they were coming south on Hanson and they looked up and they saw the crossing arms go down. It took them nine minutes to go around and get to that accident victim. Nine additional minutes because of that crossing. We need one more, one more that we can count on. 
If you're on the west side of town, you can count. Round Lake Boulevard, you're going to get over the tracks. you got an overpass. Mm -hmm. If you're on the east side, Coon Rapids Boulevard comes over the top of the tracks. You know that you can get through. Hanson Boulevard, Egret, Crooked Lake Boulevard, anywhere in the center of town, it's, it's a crapshoot, and you have no idea. So this is a very important, getting one, one more grade separation right in the center of town is extremely important. The residents in the, the, in the surrounding neighborhood are very concerned, and I understand that. And it's one of those things where it's easy to say, well, for the greater good, um, but when you're not the one having to look at this new bridge in your backyard. So it, it does come with challenges, and we're just going to work through it as best we can. I understand this is a roughly $25 million project, and uh, city, and, county, and the railroad are yeah. also pitching in, but you know, yeah. how, how much are we looking at uh, from the state? So we're looking at 50% of the, 50% of the uh, price to come from the, from the state. So we're going down there today to really seek about $13 million, or that ballpark. Um, and then 30% will come from, and I don't remember all the numbers, 30% from the county or CTIB. There's 5% from the city and 5% from Burlington Northern. Burlington Northern at, um, at one point mentioned that they would be willing to contribute more. I haven't seen any number higher than their, than their minimum contribution, which is 5%. But they are very excited for, to get this done because they recognize it would be better for them for staging. So now you're testifying, is it uh, before a House committee, a Senate committee? Thank you. Um, today, I think, we are, I think we are going in front of a Senate committee. No, maybe it's a House committee. I don't even okay. know. It's the same presentation. Well, well, so it, I just go where Chief Piper tells me to go. <laughs> and that's what I was going to say is that I know uh, Chief John Piper is the one that's yeah. kind of leading the coalition down there. And certainly uh, he's been looking at this crossing improvement for yeah. several years. In probably 25 years that I've been involved in local government or governmental affairs or, you know, or have had lobbyists around me, there is nobody I've seen that is as aggressive, consistent, and deliberate as Chief John Piper on this bridge. Um, I mean, this is, it's so fun to see his emails with the governor's office and the senators and the reps. You know, it, it, yeah, he is on task, and if we get this grade this grade separation, it will be in no small part to his efforts. All right, there'll probably be a little uh, notation or a plaque uh, well, I somewhere call it, around the project. I call it the John Piper Bridge, so. <laughs> Very well said. Uh, anything else that you'd like to talk to uh, us about today? Um, I don't think so. The plans are um, really in the works right now for the 4th of July Carnival. Um, there's gonna be some expansion this year. I think I might've mentioned it last month, I'm not sure. Um, they're looking at doing a 5K on Saturday morning. Uh, the parade route was almost really good last year. Um, we just a couple little tweaks so we don't overlap and run into each other. And uh, the parade is going to be, um, I think, even better this year. Um, the carnival should be great. And the fireworks will, again, be fabulous. Last year they were ranked one of the top communities' fireworks in the, in the region. And uh, I don't expect any less this year. That's right, you shared some of uh, the video of those fireworks with us here at CTN. I was just sitting in my lawn chair and I thought, I have to record this. And I recorded it and it turns out that's the video that ends up on the Community Strength Foundation and anywhere where they're highlighting it, they highlight that video. So I, I got lucky. Citizen journalist. <laughs> there you go. Jerry Cook. All right, well, thank you so much, Mayor Cook, for being with us today. And of course, we thank our viewers. I'm Steve Antis. For all of us here at CTN, thanks for watching.